It's my responsibility to bring words to the streets. I'm not reaching everybody, but one of these moments could mean the world to somebody. So this is why we go in the name of Christ the King. We're in this um, series. We've been talking about discipleship and what it means to follow Christ, not just what it means to believe in Christ. To believe in Christ, there is a mental aspect. Something has to be revealed. God's word, which we're blind to, has to be opened or else, listen to this, you'll be left to just see it your way. You and I would be left in darkness, living life based upon our own convictions, our own set of values. We'll determine what we're going to be about in life unless God speaks superimposes his will on top of our will and causes us not to want it our way no more now we want it his way see that's what god has to do on the inside to bring about what discipleship looks like it looks like a person who has been overcome their will has been subdued and surrendered to god and they say lord no longer me having my way in my life now i want you to have your way in my life it's a disciple there's no list of things you have to do to certainly say I qualify as a disciple, but the disciple look like something. <laughs> and I go back to an image we've talked about before. Um, I grew up in my younger days in West Oakland. We used to go over here to the Lux and we used to watch Chinese Kung Fu movies. You go there all day, you a few dollars and get you some cheese pizza and you'll be in there all day, watch a couple movies. But the concept was always somebody who was the master who had the master style and you would have somebody who became listen to this his disciple i want to learn that style so i'm gonna go where you go i'm gonna eat what you eat i'm gonna practice how you practice because i want my life i want my skill to be like your skill if you will so this was listen to this an on purpose mentality this was a decision that says i'm following him now <laughs> There's something he has that I need, and so now I will put myself through whatever in order to learn what he has come to know already. It's a disciple. Disciples go through a process that God causes us to understand it's better when he has his way in our lives. You gotta hear that right now. That is actually better that I don't get my way in my life is actually will be better for me if God has it his way in my life. That context is kind of hard because when you get to a certain age, I remember as a teenager, my mama used to think she would, she knew what was best for me to enjoy life. <laughs> but I had my own plans and I began to come against what my mother's plan for what's best for me came against what, what my plan to be bet what was best for me. And so there was a conflict and there was an age range where I wasn't old enough to fend off her will wanting to be had in my life and so there would be some trouble coming my way for resisting her will. But I found out that in her kingdom, if you will, her domain, living under her house and under her rules, that it was better for me when she had it her way. There was more gifts, more surprise, more, more, you know what I'm saying? There was more things coming my way when I surrendered to let her have it her way. Listen to this, in her house, <laughs> with her stuff. And so here's God coming to us saying, you, you are mine. <laughs> and I know what's best for you and what I want out of you. And so the call then is to surrender. And that's what a disciple has done. A disciple has seen what is needed, who is needed, and they have determined internally, I agree with him, and not only do I agree with him in theory, I agree with him in practice. And I begin to walk in a different direction. I begin to do what he does now because listen, I'm his disciple. That's a hard process because in order for that to happen, you have to actually look at you giving up your way as a good thing. <laughs> Because if you still think your way is the best way, there's a fight that's going to happen. And listen to this, because you and I are in control of us, we're going to win that fight every time to our own trouble. But when I recognize that my way ain't the best way, then I begin to pray for God to do something in me that he can overcome me and I can surrender to say I want it his way. That's a process. And that's an internal determination because God ain't going to force you to be a robot and do it his way. 
He wants a conviction of what he's done for us. He wants the love that has been shown to us that rises back up in us in love towards him to now cause us to obey his will. He don't want to even force us. He don't want us to do it his way with the threat of you're going to get in trouble if you don't. If God has to threaten us to be good, then we don't understand that he's already good. We don't understand that he knows what's best. That his character knows what's best, wouldn't put us in a harmful situation. And so it has to bring me to a place to say yes to him. And so that's what God has to do is he has to break our resistance and give us a new heart. Instead of saying no, our heart now says yes to the Lord. <laughs> Yes to you taking over my life. Yes to you using my time for your plans, your purpose. Yes to me trying to figure out what I want to do more time now. I spend saying, what do you want me to do? That's what yes looks like. That's not just what yes talks like. Yes looks like a person surrendering, searching God's word, looking at Jesus' example to see how he lived and then pray for that life to be lived through us. That that's where our greatest joy is. And listen, if you don't see that as the greatest joy, that is that it's a blessing to be at one with God in this world. It's a blessing to live in peace with God. When you know you're walking towards God to see him face to face one day, you know that there is the best thing you can do right now is to be in agreement with him in his world using his stuff. And I'm talking his stuff, not just your body, your physical, but even your time belongs to the Lord. <laughs> If there is a plan and he created us for a plan, then there are expectations. Everybody say expectations. expectations. God is expecting something from you and I in response to what he's done for us. He's expecting that if you truly have seen what I've done for you, then I'm expecting you to begin to act in accordance with that. <laughs> If, I'm, if I am everything and you're following me, I expect that as you recognize my way is best, you begin to surrender to my will. So today I want to talk about the aim of discipleship. A disciple is a disciple because he has decided on purpose, I'm following Jesus. Anybody decided to say I'm following Jesus already? Anybody already decided? I'm not asking are you perfect, you got it all together. You just have decided I know his way is the best way. <laughs> I know he's been better to me than I've been to myself, so I want to follow him and get what he has prepared for me. And so then we have an aim. We're pointing at something. We're leaning in a direction. We're, we're, we're going in a certain pathway because there's a purpose behind what we are. We don't just get disciples just to have a title. We have a title because it's who we are. It identifies that person. It's a label. And we, our lives should say this is what a disciple looks like. The context for our passage today is first looking at the great disciple, Jesus, who gives us a picture. I want you to hear this. He's not just our Lord and Savior, the one that's going to get us to heaven. But he is our true human example of what it looks like to live for God. Did you hear what I just said? Yes, sir. He's not just a picture of that God sent the Savior down to live and die on the cross, the blood and all of the things that go along with the story of the gospel. It's not just him as my Lord and Savior who overcame sin, death, and the grave, but he was Christ, also my substitute, who came in human form to live according to God's will on my behalf. He didn't just die at the cross for me. But listen to me, he used his time in this world to live how God wants his sons and daughters to live. So he's saying to us, you supposed to look like me. This is what he means by conforming us into the image of Christ, that we begin to not do everything he did per se, but we begin to aim after the same thing he was aiming after. Jesus was aiming for something, listen, with his life. What are you aiming for? What you trying to get done? Listen, with your life. I'm not just talking about what you're going to try to do tomorrow, but like, where is your life headed? What is going to be the summary of your life? What are your goals, convictions? What are you about? What are you trying to do as a statement? Listen, with your life. Because if you're trying to make a statement with your life, then your days need to look a certain kind of way. You need to begin, to, if, you're going to, if it's going to look like that, you have to on purpose begin to act in accordance with that to make it be real. Because, you know, when New Year's come, we make 
a lot of resolutions about certain things we're going to stop doing, start doing. And if you don't keep up your convictions, baby, in February, you ain't doing what you said you was going to do no more. You said it, but you didn't on purpose keep it up. So God says, I'm calling you to something on purpose, something that needs to walk you through your journey. So Jesus' life was the pattern of what life is supposed to look like when it's surrendered to God. Ephesians chapter 5 says this, Therefore be imitators of God as beloved children and walk in love as Christ loved us and gave himself up for us, a fragrant offering and sacrifice to God. He says, be an imitator of God. Be like God. God loved so much he gave. He didn't take anything from us. He didn't require something from us, but he was willing to give something from himself. How many of us know the scripture says you've been blessed to be a blessing. It was a beautiful thing that even on yesterday, as we were packing the turkeys, preparing to drive here to deliver the turkeys over here, um, so I got a phone call, hey, can you drop my box off? Cool, I'm on my way to you. And then somebody called me out there and said, hey, I'm a little short on something, can you can you loan, let me hold $100? I'm like, cool, I'll drop it off to you on my way after I drop off this box. On my way, when I got to the place where I dropped off the box at, they came outside, got the boxes, and they gave me a hundred dollars. I went to the next spot where I had already agreed out of my money, I'm gonna give them the hundred. God said, Don't even worry about it, I got the hundred dollars. So I received something for me, it came to me, but it wasn't for me. It was for somebody else who was needing, and God was showing me this ain't just you being good. This is me showing my goodness to my people, and even you get to see is God answering prayers that you don't even know nothing about. That I had already stirred their heart to give something. <laughs> and somebody going to hit you right after with the call that they need something. And this is how I work, says God. But he works through people who have a surrendered heart, who just want him to get glory. Your life, my life has to have an aim. You got to be pointing at something. I'm trying to get there. I'm trying to, that's what I see my life. That's the idea for life. That's the goal. That's my mission. So God has to give us an aim. So he has to enter our story instead of letting us look low. He calls us to look higher. He says, I got bigger goals. I got bigger plans. I got how you use your time. God says matter. God says it matters. So I want to get more involved in your time and how you spend your time, what you're spending your time for. What's the aim? What are you trying to get out of life? And so this is why he calls us into discipleship. Christ loved us and gave himself up for us. Here's the engine that ran in Jesus heart. John 6, 35 through 40 says this. Jesus said, I am the bread of life, and he who comes to me shall never hunger, and he who believes in me shall never thirst. But I said to you that you have seen me and yet do not believe. All that the Father gives will come to me, and the one who comes to me I will by no means cast out. For I have come down from heaven not to do my own will, but the will of him who sent me. This is the will of the Father who sent me, that of all he has given me, I should lose nothing, but should raise it up at the last day. And this is the will of him who sent me, that everyone who sees the Son and believes in him may have everlasting life, and I will raise him up at the last day. What I want us to see through Jesus' model is that Jesus had some things going on for him in his communication and relationship with the Father that it positioned his life to be a certain kind of way. You gotta hear what I'm saying. Jesus was down here doing his work on purpose. The first thing he talks about is, he said, I came down in verse 38 from heaven not to do my will but the will of my Father. He knew his purpose. He says, I'm down here not for my own agenda, I'm down here to advance God's agenda. He knew his purpose. His purpose set him up for clarity and intention, meaning if I'm supposed to be down here to do that, me doing anything else is a waste of time. See, this is how you evaluate your own circumstance. Sometimes we don't need life to correct us and we can self-correct based upon our convictions. What I'm about, I'm going to be about it. And so me being about this, even when other things come up and I'll say no to that because I'm already saying yes to this, that's going to keep us where God wants us to be. It's following his plan, his purpose, having a conviction in our lives for what God wants. But he says, this is the will. He says, I'm down here not to do my will, 
but I'm down here to do his will. Look at the, the next piece of how that connects. It says in verse number 38, this is the will of the Father who sent me, that of everyone he has given me, I should lose nothing, but raise it up at the last day. So he says, not only do I understand my purpose, there's some people who's going to be impacted if I don't be who I'm supposed to be. He's looking at his assignment. He's seeing the people as well connected to his assignment. And he says, I'm not going to fail being what God wants me to be because it's not just about me. It's about him and them. And I stand in between. This is the gift of humanity. God says, I will have a type, a, a type of people in the world who are about each other, who lift each other up, who support each other because they believe in me. They see that I supported them when they down. They, they model, they practice on each other what I've done for them in Christ. That's the Christian community. He says there's some people that's going to be impacted if I do not do what he told me to do. I think about that as I drive to this park on Sundays. Like this is an actual thing. <laughs> This is an actual thing. People, just as I'm on my way there, people are on their way there. <laughs> and this started with just a conversation from God to a thing that I didn't know what this would look like. <laughs> Will they sit down? Will they stand up? Will I have a paper? Will I have a Bible? I didn't, I didn't know. I had no idea. <laughs> I just heard him say, do you see all that? <laughs> Get out there in it somewhere. <laughs> If you say you see me, you love me, and you know what I did for you, show me that you know by how you live, not just how you talk. Give yourself away. Model. This is the example. Ephesians 5 said, be an imitator of God and Christ who, listen, gave himself for us. He gave himself away to the plan of God. He dove in and said, I'm falling into your plan, God. I'm falling into your purpose. I surrender to you that you know what's best for my time down here. And I'm going to work my hardest not to make myself happy, but I'm going to work hard to make you happy. <laughs> that you satisfied with how I'm living, using my time, the gifts that you gave me. He says, so not only will there be people impacted by him doing the will of God. But in verse 40, he says, and this is the will of him who sent me. That everyone who sees the Son and believes in him may have everlasting life. So you have to think about this in a two-edged sword. On one side, this is Jesus on purpose doing this because he knows these things are real realities. If I don't give my life, they shut off from the kingdom. There's no bounce back for him if I don't do it. So that's his actual heart. And that's still at the same time, it's a scripture for us to hold our faith on. It says the will of God was that everyone who sees Christ and believes him, believes in him, will have everlasting life. And he will raise him up at the last day. The attitude of Jesus is they got to be able to see me. So I'm going to live my life not quiet on the sideline, but I'm going to live my life for God out in public. <laughs> I'm taking God from just my private thoughts in my head and I'm going to go into a world that does not know what God looks like, how God acts, how God treats people and I'm going to let God do the treating and loving and acting through me. Yeah. This is a person saying I surrender. I want to be like you. I'm a disciple. Take over my life. Use my time. Use my car, my gas, my abilities, my skills to say something with my life about how good you are. <laughs> See, God has to have become good to you to make you say, I, I'm going to give you all my stuff. <laughs> God, you got all my stuff. You've been so good to me. You have given me more than I deserve. And you have overwhelmed me in places that this stuff I got can't give me anyway. It can't give me this joy, this peace, this security. And so now I want you. And in trade for you, me giving, you giving yourself to me, I'm giving you everything I got. And I'm letting my life speak that as well as my mouth i'm on purpose turned up for the king you know that remember they had the song turned down for what <laughs> then this is the real place that that attitude <laughs> needs to be lived at because we got every reason to turn up his mercies are brand new every day his compassions fail not. Great is his faithfulness. He walks us through storms and gets us through situations. He opens doors that people want to keep shutting your face. He's been too good for me to not act like. And God said, remember Kevin Hart said, say it with your chest. God said, say it with your life. 
Say thank you with your life as well as your lips. He knew that there were people depending on him to be who God wanted him to be. So he, he, he surrendered to God's will. Look at what Jesus was hungry for. John chapter 4, verse 31 through 34 says this. Meanwhile, the disciples were urging him, saying, Rabbi, eat. But he said to them, I have food to eat that you do not know about. So the disciples said to one another, has anyone brought him something to eat? And Jesus said to them, my food is to do the will of him who sent me and to accomplish his work. Do you hear his focus? He said, I'm not down here just to get satisfied by something this world can offer me. He says, I'm looking for a deeper satisfaction. Is anybody else looking for a deeper satisfaction? Because we did try some stuff. Tried this, tried that, chased that, tried to get that. Some of the stuff we chased after and got it. We wanted to give it back once we got it. So we know we, we chased the wrong stuff. Our appetites get built up for the wrong things. But Jesus said, my main appetite, the thing that's going to satisfy me, keep me content to know that I lived the life I was supposed to live is by staying locked in on God's plan for me. I'm trying to get my work done, baby. That's the only way to go home in peace is to have finished what God has for you to do. That God, you didn't, my life wasn't wasted. God, I finally got the picture that I wasn't down here just to do me. But I was down here to represent you, to say thank you for what you've done in life by how I live. You said, I got food. I got something that satisfies me that's not natural stuff. Natural food run out. You get hungry again. But I want you to hear the idea, though. He's talking about hunger because they was hungry. He had been working all day, so they ran to the village to get some food because they like, we starving. So I know he's starving. He's been doing most of the work. They get back and Jesus, there's no hunger because he had just met the woman at the well. The woman at the well had come to him and her whole life got flipped upside down. Jesus was saying, that's what I'm down here for. Now, I can wait on the natural food. You can wait on some stuff you acting like you can't wait on because you got to recognize you already got everything you need in God. God says, go to gorging and satisfying yourself in me. The next passage says in Philippians 2, Jesus humbled, humbled himself for purpose when he found out what he was supposed to do he found out people were depending upon him he humbled himself to get down into the position because listen to this our thoughts are not like God's thoughts the plans we have and the plans he has are totally different he may use the same gift I thought the rap gift was going to get me on stages and platforms. And he like, no, nah, you going to use the gift, but I'm going to take it somewhere else. And there's going to be some stages and platforms, but they're going to be up here on this side. <laughs> You're going to do it at some places down there where ain't nobody going to be looking but heaven. But will you go and do what I told you to do? So God says, you got some stuff that's from me, but you got to surrender it back to me so I can use it for my plan. He says in this passage, so if... In verse 1, there is any encouragement in Christ. If there's any comfort from love, any participation in the spirit, any affection and sympathy, complete my joy by being of the same mind, having the same love, being in full accord and of one mind. Do nothing from selfish ambition or conceit, but in humility count others more significant than yourselves. Let each of you Look not only to his own interests, but also to the interests of others. So hold on a second. Right there, he's giving us a way to be. He's showing us a way of living. He's asking us, if you tasted any love from Christ, if you tasted any comfort, any love, if you had any participation in what his spirit communicates, if you know anything about God and Jesus and their heart, he's saying that I want you to show it by how you treat each other. Don't do nothing selfishly because you know it ain't all about you. It's all about him. <laughs> he says if you, if you had any connection with what God has done for you in Christ, I want y'all to practice that on each other. And then he goes into the example of what should fuel our continual working that out that God has worked into us. Look what he says in verse number five. Have this mind among yourselves, which is also your, which is yours in Christ who thought, who though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped, 
but emptied himself by taking the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of men, and being found in human form. He humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on the cross. Therefore, God has highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name that is above every name, so that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of the Father. So Jesus came down saying, I'm not going to make myself great. I'm going to make myself obedient to the Father, and I'm going to let him determine am I great or not. <laughs> I'm going to let the Father speak about my greatness by me just saying I'm going to be locked in to the yes I gave to the Father. He says you don't be great by letting people determine if you're great or not. You be great by letting God determine if you're great or not. So we follow him. He gives us a picture, but he did this on purpose. But look at the double humbling. You got to see this because this is Jesus saying I'm going to get lower. <laughs> I know I already am, <laughs> but I'm going to get lower so that I can do what my father wants me to do. Listen what it says in verse number six. Who though he was in the form of God, he did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped. But listen to what he did. But he emptied himself. So what he's saying is, though he was side by side with God, him and the Father are one. There's no separation. There's no greater one, lesser one. They are equal in their connection. But he didn't stand up and say, well, I got to go down. You, you just like me. He didn't get on himself. He said, if that's what our heart is beating for, I'm going down. Prepare me a body. It says he didn't look at his bigness or his level where he was to make him not be able to stoop low. And Jesus said, you better do the same thing. Don't, don't act like just because you okay right now that you wasn't okay before. <laughs> and you see people who ain't okay right now, you act like you didn't forgot that you wasn't there. That's where you was a few minutes ago. You better act like you know Jesus, he humbled himself. Though he was, he got low. And then when he got low on a human form, he didn't come down here and try to save himself from dr trouble and drama or save himself from the purpose. He didn't try to have life on easy street. Look at how it says it on the next one. It says in verse number eight, first he looked at himself in the godly form and he says, I'm gonna get low. Then he looks at himself being found in human form. He humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on the cross. He said, the humbling I'm going to take is I'm going to let it look like I'm losing, even though I know this is the way to victory. They can't see it. They're going to chalk me up with an L. They're going to say he went out. <laughs> but I'm not going out. Listen to this. I'm going in. <laughs> I'm going into the will of my Father. I'm going into the plan and the purposes of my God. I'm going in in greater obedience to God because I know he's going to determine whether this was a victory or a loss. He humbled himself to the point of death to make it look, listen, he had power to not let that happen to him. But he knew that if he didn't let it happen to him, it was going to happen to us. The rejection from God was coming our way, so he stayed in position even though it was going to cost him something. Listen, this is the attitude of a disciple. <laughs> to follow God, I don't care what it takes for me to follow God. I don't care what the world says. I'm walking with him. You're not going to cause me to walk contrary. I'm, I got a made up mind. It says he humbled himself by becoming obedient to letting bad things happen to him so that good things might happen through him. I want to talk to you for a minute about pain. Sometimes we go through pain and trauma and trouble and we wonder where was God at? God says I was even watching over and through the pain and the trouble and the trauma that even that pain will one day serve a greater purpose. It wouldn't just be a bad thing. I'm able to take a bad thing, an uncomfortable thing and make it work out for a good thing. This is why we got to keep our eyes on the cross because God took a bad thing. <laughs> It happened to Jesus. He actually, listen to he didn't just die, get sick. He got put to death. His life was taken. He was killed. We're going to stop you from living at this point. We're going to do something to stop you. It happened to him. And God didn't change his mind. God didn't, he didn't, he didn't want to prevent it. But he knew that through that sacrifice and surrender, there would be life for others. It's an attitude 
So we begin to aim at the right things. Acts chapter 20 says it this way. And Paul speaking in testimony said, when they came to him, he said to them, you yourselves know how I lived among you the whole time from the first day that I set foot in Asia, serving the Lord with all humility and with tears and with trials that happened to me through the plots of the Jews. I did not shrink from declaring to you anything that was profitable and teaching you in public and from house to house, testifying to both Jews and to Greeks of repentance towards God and of faith in our Lord Jesus Christ. And now behold, I am going to Jerusalem constrained by the Spirit, not knowing what will happen to me there except the Holy Spirit testifies to me that in every city that imprisonment and afflictions await me. But I do not account my life of any value nor precious or as precious to myself, if only I may finish my course and the ministry which I received from the Lord Jesus to testify to the gospel of the grace of God. He had a focus with his life. There was a witness to him, and you've heard the story. There was a witness to him that if you go over there, trouble waiting on you. But he was saying in his heart, that's where God told me to go. So is God's talking going to be louder or is the trouble talking going to be louder? Because, you know, the sight of trouble will make you run from stuff. The sight of difficulty will make you not go out for the job. The sight of trouble and the drama of filling out the paperwork, going, standing in line, the thought of something will rob you from stepping into what God is calling you into. This is why a disciple is determined on the outcome, the goal. What am I trying to get? And if I need what I'm trying to get, I better act like I actually need it and go get it. <laughs> you can't stand here and know you need it and it's over there to go get it and you must not know you need it then. Because if you know you need it, you should respond accordingly. So God says this is the internal attitude, the engine. He says, I don't count my life of any value or precious to myself. The only thing that I want to do is, he's saying, I want to finish my course. He's saying, this is what my mind is set on. Not having it my way, I want to get my work done and have it his way. He said, this is my focus. It's not on what's going to happen. Listen to me. I'm not afraid of that. I'm more concerned with what's going to happen through me. Do you hear that? He says, God, I want to honor you with my life. I want my life to count in Christ's direction. I want my life to put a, uh, a, a amen in the air for Jesus. I want my life to have that fragrance. When I leave, they'll say that boy was about the Lord. <laughs> That, that he would get glory for me having lived my time will speak about him. <laughs> that that would be the summary statement. He says, I want to live in that way. I'm leaning in that, that direction. That's my aim. So I'm not going to try to avoid the trouble that's up here if God said that's where I'm calling you to go to. Because then he's going to test your disciple. People up here, he's going to test your gang. So he's going to test your discipleship. <laughs> Are you really following me or not? And there'll be moments when you have difficulties that you face with and you have to walk through the difficulty in order to get what God has promised for you to have. The text says in Luke, Jesus' aim teaches us what it means to be great. He has to redirect our focus. Greatness is seen not through our eyes, but through the Lord's eyes. Here is Jesus talking. He says, for who is the greater? The one who reclines at the table or the one who serves? Is it the one who recline, um, is it not the one who reclines at the table? But I am among you as the one who serves. So here's Jesus giving himself as the example. I'm, I'm, I'm the greatest one that can ever be. <laughs> and I'm not down here reclining at the table. I'm down here trying to get my work done. <laughs> I'm down here doing what my father sent me to do. I'm your Lord and Savior, but I'm also the picture of what you're supposed to look like. Turned up for Jesus. I'm trying to get my work done. I understand what true greatness is. It's not me trying to do something else to be great so that people look at me in the right way. No, I want heaven to look at me in the right way. <laughs> greatness is determined in a different direction. Jesus says in Mark 10, but it shall not be so among you that whoever would be great among you must be your servant. And whoever would be first among you must be slave of all. For even the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. He saw his life as a gift to be given. He saw his time spent with God as not just for him, 
but he might have something from God to communicate to us in this world. Do you not know that your private time with God, your worship, your fellowship, your prayers, your individual relationship with God is not just for you. Though you and I benefit by spending time with the Lord. Bless you, Brother Moon. But our time spent with the Lord is to get more God in us. So as I go out into this world that has a, just a little bit of God in it, I'm able to overflow. Stuff can pour up out of me. That's been poured into me on somebody else's life. And this is how he gets glory. Whoever will be great must be a servant. Actually to consider yourself, listen, a slave. And I'm not talking slave in terms of the negative sense, but a person who says I'm captive, I'm locked in, I'm chained in to doing good to other people. <laughs> this is why I exist. Remember, Jesus came in, was anointed by the Father, came into the world, went about doing good, healing all who were oppressed of the devil. People who were being impacted by the devil's work and what sin was doing. Jesus said, I came to throw the tables over. That's why it's called good news. I came to enter your bad news and bring you some good news. <laughs> I'm, I'm seeing you frowned up and worried and complaining. I came to see you smile and have peace. But it comes by trusting and resting in me. As we close, then there's this idea that we have to wrestle with in our closing because there's a cost to surrender. There's a cost to give up your will for his will. It's, you, go, you actually gotta lose one to get the other. You actually gotta, if you're gonna get wet, you gotta actually jump in the pool. You can't stay all day tapping. Get on in the water, man, <laughs> if you wanna swim. So, so, so you got to get into it. There's a cost. You have to make a determination. I'm going to follow the Lord. So listen, discipleship is about a person who has died to self and is aiming at living for Christ with his convictions at work in them. Listen, I'm aiming to have what he wants, the dominant trait in my life as I live. I'm trying to live to please him. I'm trying to live to let my life say that Christ is real. He said, this is my intention. This is a disciple. I've died to my way. I'm asking God to live in me. Jesus then teaches about this. It says this life, it begins at the cross. And the cross is not the terrible end of an otherwise God-fearing and happy life. But it meets us at the beginning of our communion. Our communion with Christ because when Christ calls a man he calls him to come and die in order for us to live we got to die that's what repentance is repentance is give up your way stop doing it your way the way you've been thinking all of that you got to give that up and say father teach me this is how we get transformed by the renewing of our mind. Our mind has to be saying, God, I need to fill my mind with new thoughts about life, new ways to use my time and my talents and my gifts and my treasure, a new way of operating in this world. I need you to do something in me to show me because I'm not just supposed to think about God. He calling me to live for God. <laughs> I want your life to have a fragrance that you've been with me. I want your life to have a aroma that you've been around the Lord. <laughs> There's something different about how they conduct themselves. Not that they, we, we do business, but how you do business matters. I went to, um, to get the U-Haul to get the turkeys. And you know, normally you don't sometimes want to go to the U-Haul that's in the hood, like, you know, cause the business don't be right sometimes. The customer service it be. And so I needed, I found out what I had to do was, I had to call cause I actually need to get the truck a day earlier than what I ordered it for. So I call, expecting it may be a challenge. I don't know if they let me do it. They got enough trust. The way they took care of me, we was hugging and all that on the way out the door. From the phone call to the setup to the waiting for me, we got your setup right there. Just pull up right there, sign that thing right there. You'll be out of here in a second. They go to get them turkeys out to the community. And I said, I said, I said, these my peoples right here. Well, that's how we do it. <laughs> I, and we, I, I say, if you work at U-Haul, work at U-Haul to the glory of the Lord. <laughs> it's a way of being at the place. It don't matter where you at. <laughs> I'm a type of person that happens to be right here. <laughs> and I got love that has flowed to me. And now this love is flowing through me. I want to ease people's problems. I don't want to be a source of discomfort. I want to bring comfort, even if it's dealing with a small transaction of reordering the time frame for a truck at U-Haul. 
This is how we get to allow God to use us. You don't have to be something great to do something great. <laughs> you just have to understand what real greatness is. It's in serving other people. It's in seeing other people rightly. So here is the closing of this then. When one of those who reclined at the table with him heard these things, he said to him, blessed is everyone who will eat bread in the kingdom of God. But he said to him, a man once gave a great banquet and invited many. many. And at the time of the banquet, he sent a servant to say to those who have been invited, come, for everything is now ready. But they all alike began to make excuses. First said to him, I have bought a field and I must go out and see it. Please have me excused. Another said, I bought five yoke of oxen and I go to examine them. Please have me excused. And another said, I have married a wife, and therefore I cannot come. So the servant came and reported these things to the master. Then the master of the house became angry. He said to his servant, go out quickly to the streets and the lanes of the city and bring in the poor and the cripple and the blind and the lame. And the servant said, sir, what you commanded has been done and still there is room. And the master said to the servant, go out to the highways and the hedges and compel people to come in that my house may be filled. For I tell you, none of those men who were invited shall taste my banquet. First of all, there's a witness to us about the cost of following God. Listen, the cost of you being what God is calling you to be. It don't just happen by God saying words over you. It don't just happen because somebody prayed over you. It don't just happen because you've been walking with the Lord for some seasons. Every day you got to wake up determined that I'm living for Jesus today. Paul said I die daily. I'm resisting my way. I'm fighting myself because I know myself. And he's the hardest person to overthrow. <laughs> I can tell you no in a heartbeat. <laughs> But I'm telling you something about telling yourself no when everything in you trying to say yeah. And giving you reasons why it's okay right now. And so what you have to do is have a determined mind that on purpose, I'm serving the Lord. He says that they were invited, but they saw something else as more important. Whatever your thing might be that's keeping you from giving your full self to the Lord. That's moving you from just a head knowledge about God to actually now a life lived for God. God says, let that go because you don't really need that at the end of the day. What you really need me is you really need to understand you need to be up in this bank without it is through else you're going to starve to death. He invites them in and people had other priorities. The disciple has made Christ his priority. Her priority, Christ, becomes first place. I want my life to say something about you. The second piece of it is there's a cost to it that's deeper. It says, now great crowds accompanied him and he turned and said to them, if anyone comes to me and does not hate his own father and mother and wife and children and brothers and sisters, yes, even his own life, he cannot meet be my disciple. That, that's some tough talking. He's saying whoever prioritizes anything else over me doesn't understand who I really am and what they really need. He's not talking hate in the way that we hate. We didn't fell out with somebody. No mess. Don't call me no more. I'm through with you. He's not that hate. He's saying the person that I put on the highest level is God. Nobody else. He says this is the understanding that the disciple has because even if they don't follow you, I'm still following you, Lord. <laughs> even if they don't want it your way, I do want it your way. So I'm going to stand here in my position while I pray for them. The disciple has made that the priority. Verse 27 says, whoever does not bear his own cross and come after me cannot be my disciple. Here's what it means. The cross is a symbol of death a cross is a symbol of denying self jesus is there because he denied himself nevertheless not my will but let your will be done god's will sent him to a cross sometimes the will of god will put you in a tight spot but listen to this he said i still want god to get the glory out of my life i'll take a tight spot if it mean god getting glory out of my life he said, here's the aim, here's the plan. I'm living for the actual plan 
God has for me. He says, verse 28 or 27, whoever does not bear his own cross and come after me, that's a pursuit, that's on purpose, cannot be my disciple. For which of you desiring to build a tower does not first sit down and count the cost, whether he has enough to complete it? Otherwise, when he has laid a foundation and is not uh, able to finish, all will see it, all who see it begin to mock him, saying, this man began to build and was not able to finish. Or what king going out to encounter another king in war will not sit down first and deliberate whether he is able with 10,000 men to meet him who comes against him with 20,000? And if not, while the other is yet a great way off, he sends a delegation and acts for terms of peace. So therefore, any one of you who does not renounce all that he has cannot be my disciple. What he's talking about is a trade. He's talking about a surrender. What he's talking about is dying to our plan for his. He puts it in the context of this story, which I love. He says, who, if they own their way out to war, and they only got 10,000 people, and you finna go fight against 20,000, does not look at what they going into and actually calculate, can I actually win with the way I'm going? Okay. Is the strategy I'm about to build, is this strategy gonna work out in the long run? I'm not talking in the short run. In the short run, it may look favorable, we'll do whatever. But when I'm looking long distance and how I want this thing to end, I want it to end in victory. Listen to this. I'm able to pay attention to the full story. Because he says, if I recognize I'm going to fall short, I'm able to send a delegation and say, that's all right. We cool. We dropped the B. <laughs> We're not ready to see y'all yet. What he's talking about is the intentional mindset of the cost that God has for us to receive this everything. I'm talking to you about the high price of a free gift the gift is free what christ has done for us is free he paid for the whole thing salvation is for free god did it in christ and by the spirit he bears witness to us he says now come on and get it it's free but it's gonna cost you everything the willingness to say because this gift this is why the pearl of great price scripture matters is somebody finding something so valuable that they go away and they sell everything they have in order to purchase the field that the great price in this thing is in so they can always have it close to them. They value Christ more than the stuff they was giving up. A disciple has made a determining factor. He has decided that Christ is more valuable than anything else. Listen, that will keep me from Christ. I want what he has more than I want what they have what that has, what that offers, what that promises. It's a determining factor. God, I pray that by your spirit, you will speak to us about your goodness that causes us to see you in a bigger way. That we'll see you in your true value, your true worth. And that we, in, in seeing you clearly, you, we got you too small. Our Jesus is too little. That's why we're not serving him in the way you're calling us. Is because he just, he just did that for me back there. It's not this present Jesus walking with me, keeping me. It's not that Jesus up in front waiting on me, that he's putting stuff out of my way in order for me to keep on pushing. My Jesus, just he's he way back there at the cross. I haven't been paying attention to his activity in my life right now. So that he would be a big Jesus. He'll command more of my attention and I will live with an alertness that says I'm not just living for myself. I'm living to glorify the Father and the Lord who's with me. Father, you need witnesses in this world. Witnesses are those who follow you, who see you at work in their lives, and they're not afraid to go public. They'll tell everybody they can because they actually want you to get your glory. Father, would you allow that to, to happen in us? that you might show yourself strong through us. As we take communion, would you remind us that this is, this is the children's meal. This is for those who sit at the table who should be disqualified if it was left on their own record. Those who sit at this table to take communion are those who know that there's no hope in themselves, that they are sinners who have fallen short of what God has wanted from his people. 
But they also recognize, though I have fallen short, Christ came down into this world to live and go the full way God wanted us to go so that his life would be traded for mine. And then as he went to the cross innocent, his death is also traded for mine. He lives for me. He dies for me. And through him, Father, I have a new relationship with you. I have my sins forgiven. I have you and I on the same page. And I also have a picture, a way my life is supposed to look, the thing I'm supposed to be about as well. What, what your children look like, I have a picture in Christ of what it looks like to be all in for the Father. To say, I'm going to say it with my chest in this world. Father, we ask that as we come to communion, we will be reminded that this is who we are. This is our identity. We are your children. You have sent your son to, pre to prepare a place for us at your table. And not only did he do that work to prepare the table, he's actually the food that's on the table. <laughs> he's actually the gift that comes to, to your people. We have Christ. And because we have Christ, we have you. Let us taste this as we come in communion. Sinners who are saved and accepted because of the finished work of Jesus. This is what we say in communion, Father. Help us to taste it even as we publicly declare. It's in Jesus' name we pray and everybody say amen, amen and thank God. Somebody get a Lord a hand praise, amen, as we get ready to come to the table. Amen. As we get ready to come to the table, we give God praise for what the blood has accomplished. I get another day to keep working on the plan. Amen. And what we're going to do is have my sister's going to come up as communion is being passed out. Sister AJ is going to come up. Amen. And bless us with a song. Amen. As we get ready to go into communion. Amen. Glory to God. Let's give the Lord a hand. Praise. Hallelujah. And Brother PLA for his faithfulness, hallelujah, coming out here every Sunday in the food ministry as well. Let's give it up for them, hallelujah. Doing that good kingdom work, amen, hallelujah. The blood that Jesus shed for me way back on Calvary, the blood that gives me strength from day to day, it will never lose its power. I know it reaches to the highest mountain and it flows to the lowest valley oh yeah 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 it's the blood that gives me strength from day to day, it will never lose its power. Hallelujah. It soothes my doubts and it calms my fears. And I'm so glad that he... He wipes away all of my tears. It's the blood that gives me strength from day to day. It will never lose its power. Oh. It reaches to the highest mountain, hallelujah. Oh, 
and it flows to the lowest valley. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. It's the blood. Hallelujah. That gives me strength. Yes, it does. From day to day, it will never lose its power. Can I get you to say this with me? Say this with me. Just say this. It was the blood. Can you say that? Hallelujah. It was the blood. Hallelujah. Say it again. Hallelujah. Uh. It was the blood. Yes, it was. I'm so glad. I'm so glad it was. Uh. Hallelujah. It was the blood. The blood that gives me strength from day to day. It will never lose its power. Hallelujah. Bless the Lord. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord God. Hallelujah. I like how you close that thing. I'm ready to sing right now. I'm going to mess up. <laughs> you close that thing out, sis. Yeah, but I love that line. It's the blood that gives me strength from day to day. That means somebody's leaning on purpose on a daily basis. On a daily basis, they're looking to what the blood has accomplished. The connection they have with the Father because of the blood. That though I have some troubles now, I won't always have these troubles. They're leaning on the very promises and person of Christ. This is what we do. The Bible says to us that on the night that Jesus was betrayed, he, he took bread. And in giving thanks after he broke it, he said to his disciples, this is my body which is broken for you. This is my substitutionary work on your behalf. It pictures I'm going to go through something for you. I'm sold out for the Father's mission. And it's going to benefit you at the end of the day. Father, we thank you for the, the on-purpose sacrifice of Jesus. He didn't let this world trip him up. He didn't let the devil talk him out of the plan. He didn't even let Peter talk him out of the plan when he said, No, you ain't going to the cross. He knew his purpose, though it was going to be painful. He was sold out for you and sold out for us. He went to prepare a place for us that where he is will forever be. And he got his work done so we could always look at what he did to give us hope. That's what we're doing. We're trusting in something that happened over 2,000 years ago. And we were not there when it happened. But the spirit and the word have testified and brought our hearts to believe in what you've done for us in that time. Way back there that even today in 2021, we would stand here looking to you, remembering what Christ did for us because you declared it to us in your word. We draw our hope from that. Father, we thank you for the body of Christ which has been broken for us. Family, let us eat together. And after he gave the bread, he took the cup, he blessed it, and he said, this cup of the new covenant has been given for the forgiveness of sins of many. He says, drink this as a way of remembering me. Our sister just sung to us about the blood, that it never loses its power. We're confident in what the blood preaches to us. It preaches you forgiven, you accepted, you are loved. God sent, sent Christ for you. I am with you and for you, says God in the blood. Father, we thank you for sending us a witness of your love. You didn't just stand back there and say you loved us, but you acted on your love. Christ, surrender to the plan so that your plan of love demonstration would be shown to us. And we thank you that you sent the Holy Spirit one day to bring us out of the dark 
of what you've done and bring us into the light of knowing that you didn't just do it somewhere out there, but you did it actually for us. The thing got personal one day. Father, we lift our glasses in the air as we remember what the blood has accomplished for us. We have access to you through the blood. We thank you. Family, let us drink together the blood of Christ shed freely for the forgiveness of our sins. And the Apostle Paul closes by saying, as often as we eat this bread and we drink this cup together, we are re-preaching Jesus, saving death until he returns. Father, we thank you. Bless the food. Bless, bless the fellowship. Bless our few moments together that we would encourage and remind one another of your very love. We thank you for this community that gathers here. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen and thank God. Somebody get a Lord a hand praise. Amen. Blessings to you.
grateful for his love. What? Talk, yep, something that you could use So you put snooze when the alarm went off Hey, we just sent to wake you up So family, let's talk Now they thought, yep, that COVID was a pandemic But it was a pandemic Cause I seen God's hand in it I seen him stand in it So we ran past man's limits He threw me in the trenches Tearing down Sims fences So relentless We pushed through the issues Tears and tissues I just wanna be used Short fuse We in a ticking time bomb but it's in the hands of God, sin won't last long Sad song folks sing on the daily The world is going crazy, everybody yelling pay me We should be yelling save me, Jesus please raise me This ain't the way you made me, take this heart you gave me and change me oh, I need you to change me Lord It's a cold world That's right, uh-huh, that's right That we living in, uh-huh, that's right That we living in, Go, go world Go. Cold world, such a cold world. That's right. That we live in. That we in. Cold, cold, world. Cold, cold world. Oh, let me talk to you. Crooked politicians not really rapping for the people. They make an evil legal. Hope you know the Lord see you. We see through. Me too, cause we love what we want to. They rouse ourselves, that's truly something that we don't do, though we post to. We close to the end, that's what I tell you. So I'm on my grind, trying to redeem the time of past failure. Been sent to compel you, though my work may seem foolish. Plus, we go through it, but Jesus did it, so we do it. My spiritual eyes lucid, can clearly see the future. Jesus coming back, motivate my maneuvers. It's truth in the room, but Christ the King, he's the ruler. He scooped me like a Uber, got your boy feeling super. Snatch me out the stupor, wouldn't let me go out like a loser. On the block like a tutor, raising. Trays, I'm a shooter, don't let the devil use you, take your life back The real empire is the kingdom, we gon' strike back Hey, we fight back, it's like that Trying to get you on the right track Better grab yourself some oil and get your life back for the sky crack That's right, get your life back for the sky crack <laughs> Oh, the Lord is on his way And he's coming to get a prepared people To take them to a prepared place Oh, hallelujah, but we go ahead and we practice now we don't just go to church, but we practice. We live in light of the love of God. We don't just talk love, but we walk love. That's right. He said, how can you say you love me whom you've never seen? And you can't love your brother or sister that you see every day. Oh, Lord, would you help us? Cold world, that's right. Uh-huh. That we living in. Uh-huh. That we living in. Cold world, that's right. It's a cold world. He said in the last days, there will be perilous times that the love of many would wax cold. But we say we are the people who are gonna not going to wax cold, but we're going to wax hot. We're going to continue to share his love because we know what he's done for us. I woke up this morning. Woke up with Jesus on my mind. What it do? I woke up this morning, Jesus on my mind. And even open up the. Let me take a little time. Gotta give God the praise. 
give God the praise. Hey, I woke up this morning with Jesus on my Before I start my grind and even open up the blind, let me take a little time. Hey, give God the praise. Give God the praise. I woke up this morning with Jesus on my mind. Before I start my grind, even open up the blind, let me take a little time. Give God the praise. Hey, give God the praise. Hey, give God the praise. We ride for the King. Yeah, we represent the kingdom. There ain't nobody greater than Jesus. And baby, I believe him. By the spirit, yeah, I seen him. The word became flesh. He jumped right into our mess just to bring our souls to rest. And yes, I confess, there's no hope without him. We too short to play with God, man. We can't even touch the rim. My situation got grim, but he became the way out. A lot of folks thought it was just a phase and all this Jesus stuff is gonna play out. So fear to stay out the way. We still banging blocks. Since his mercy don't stop, Jesus worth it don't drop. So if you're hurting, don't stop. Remember joy comes in the morning Even when it's storming Christ is still performing His priestly duties an advocate seated with the Father Intercession on our behalf By the one who walked on the water So when your road gets harder Don't stop, don't quit Draw life from his word And don't back up an inch I woke up this morning With Jesus on my mind Before I start my grind And even open up the Let me take a little time Give God the praise Give God the praise I woke up this morning with Jesus on my mind Before I start my grind and even open up the Let me take a little time and Give God the praise hey, Give God the praise Give God the praise Flight 683 I was way above the clouds I'm gonna wiggle back from those scotia On my wiggle making rounds Yeah the gospel man it pounds In my heart I'm in love When I was drowning in the flood He knew exactly where I was That's exactly what he does He leaves blind your eyes open Found out that I was chosen to preach the king in and out of Oakland Got me flying over ocean, steady moving, we in motion In the spirit like I'm floating, driven with the gospel, we've been slogan His strength that makes me potent, I'm a weapon in his hand Told him to use me how he wanted to, he started laying out the plan So much decay up in the land, we all need Jesus And can't nobody snatch us out of our hands, so I'm totally all believers Justified receivers of the grace of the king I'm in his face at the stream, he gave me more than just a dream It was more than just a thing, he said live life on mission Victor is not victims, baby, this is how we live I woke up this morning with Jesus on my mind Before I start my crying and even open up the blind Let me take a little time I gotta give God the praise Give God the praise I woke up this morning